So hello everyone. Now, so I'm Mattia Walskars. I'm a CNRS researcher at the Laboratoire Castle Bruxelles, and I'm recording this uh, rehearsal basically for uh, to put it on YouTube. So I want to give you a little bit of context. So this is a talk that I'm soon going to give uh, in a group in Trento, in Italy, who works mainly on uh, on network theory. So basically this talk is going to assume that you know a little bit of things about networks, but at the same time, there will be quite an extensive introduction into quantum optics, continuous variable quantum optics. So the title of the talk is Emergent Complex Networks in Continuous Variable Quantum Systems. Uh, and the overview is the following. So as I said, I will start by introducing quite extensively uh, the whole framework of uh, continuous variable quantum optics. Then we will move on uh, to discuss what uh, I call imprinted networks and how we engineer them. Uh, as a next step, I will start talking about emergent features, so emergent correlation networks. And then finally, uh, we will talk about like the main point, which is actually how non-Gaussian operations will affect these, uh, these, these emergent correlations, these emergent features. And then finally, of course, there will be some conclusions and an outlook. Okay, so to start with uh, continuous variable quantum optics, so let me quickly remind you uh, that light uh, is basically a solution to Maxwell's equations. So we in, uh, in quantum optics or in optics in general, we are usually mainly interested in the electric field that is uh, appearing Maxwell's equations. So we use them in vacuum because we, in our group at least, we do free space uh, quantum optics. And uh, so you then look at uh, basically the wave uh, equation type solutions to Maxwell's equations. And so a last uh, point that you should, that I want to point out already is that um, we usually look at the complex representation of the electromagnetic field. So which means that actually the field that you are going to measure is going to be the real, the real part uh, of this. So uh, what is very important into what we are doing in our group is the concept of modes. So what is an optical mode? Well, actually optical, an optical mode is a normalized solution uh, to Maxwell's equations. So basically the electric field that I showed you on the previous slide is not necessarily normalized. But so these modes, they, you can kind of construct a basis of them, uh, which is orthonormal. So basically the different, like if you take an U i and a U j, the idea is that they are orthogonal functions uh, with respect to one another. And you can use these then uh, to kind of construct any arbitrary solution to, uh, to this equation. So our global light field that I described on the previous slide could then be written as some superposition of these, uh, of these optical modes. And so what is important because we use the complex representation of the field is that these uh, coefficients that pop up here will be complex uh, coefficients. And so usually what we do in continuous variable quantum optics is that we will rewrite these coefficients explicitly in a real part, uh, which we give a label X and a, an imaginary part, which we give a label P. Later on, this will become clear why I choose X and P. And so I, I found a nice uh, picture, if you wish, or a GIF actually on, uh, on Wikipedia to which in my opinion kind of illustrates these two aspects. So um, let's say that we have here on the on the left hand side, we have this uh, light coming in, which which may be highly multimode. And uh, we can basically expand this in uh, in the mode basis or in a mode basis by sending it through in this case, it would be a prism. And you see that what comes out are these different um, frequency modes, so like different uh, well-defined frequencies. In this case, it's, it's plane waves. And this would then be basically a modal decomposition of the light that you have here in, in plane waves. So to introduce to you now the really the concepts of continuous variable 
optics, because for the moment everything is still classical. Um, I want to kind of focus on this side and really just pick out one of these individual modes. So let's say, for example, that we focus on, on the red ones, we have one plane wave, so one single mode. And if you look at the, the, the field associated with it, we have to take into account that there is a real and imaginary uh, component <clears throat> that describes basically the field strength. And this will be the following. So because um, I'm looking at the plane wave, I can now choose this UJ specifically to have this, uh, this plane wave form. And if I then measure the electric field with respect to, to some reference phase, which I scan. So I guess this is something that I should stress quite explicitly. The measurements that we do, they always need a phase reference. Like, uh, of course, you see that you have this kind of moving, uh, this moving or propagating wave. And obviously, the, like, the amplitude is something which is well-defined, but if we want to, to get information about the, the phase, we need to, to compare this to a, to a reference. And so this is basically what, what is happening here. So here I look at the strength of the field uh, compared to with respect to a given phase reference. And so you scan the phase here on, on this axis. So this is like basically standard uh, optics or standard electromagnetism. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to represent uh, this real and imaginary part that basically describes the, the complex amplitude of the field um, in, a, in a phase space. So you have one axis, which is, uh, which is the real part, one which is the imaginary part. You can now interpret this also as kind of a phasor representation of this wave, where the length of this vector here uh, gives you the amplitude of the field and the angle here uh, that you have with respect to the x-axis, for example, this gives you the phase. So this would be kind of the phase with respect to a reference and reference in this case, I guess, would just be here the, the point that we call zero. So, okay, now let's go gradually uh, to weaker fields. So what I show you here is, is in to me as a quantum optician is going to be a very strong field. Uh, and I, I will just zoom in and basically reduce the field strength such that this, this point is going to approach basically the, the center of this, of this uh, phase space. What you see when you do this and you take these measurements is that they will become a bit blurry. Um, and you can translate this as this point which basically gets a little bit of, of, of fuzziness, a little bit of uncertainty. Um, and so this goes on if you zoom in further. And so this point is gradually going to become more something like a, a statistical probability distribution. And then when we turn the field off entirely, uh, what is remarkable is that we actually still have some, uh, some noise. And so this is where we enter basically into the, the quantum realm. This is, I guess you could call these vacuum fluctuations in the, in the electromagnetic field. And so in quantum physics, you cannot, you cannot get rid of this. This is literally the, what you see when you measure the field when there is no light. And so you still get measurement outcomes and this is a, a quantum effect. So more generally speaking, uh, what is quantum light? How do we describe it? Well, we are still looking at a single mode. And what is important is when I'm quantizing everything, well, basically, what is quantum is going to be the noise. So it's going to be like the real and imaginary part of the complex amplitude of the field. So really the field strength somehow is the part that's going to, to become quantum. So I, I highlight this by putting hats here and, and turning basically this, uh, this, these real and imaginary com components into operators. So there are quantum operators that are now going to to have measurement statistics, hence uh, the noise that we see. I have this constant that popped out, which is more mainly for, for technical reasons, because we want these op operators to be, to be basically normalized. And so this is going to describe the electric field, it turns out, of a single photon. And the two is, is also there for technical, just as a, it's a convention, basically. And what I want to point out here is that actually the mode itself, so the, this 
plane wave, for example, or whatever kind of decomposition of normalized solutions of Maxwell's equations we are looking at, this is not going to become a quantum object. So this remains actually a classical, um, an element of a Hilbert space, but which is completely classical. It's related to, to Maxwell's equations, and it is not related to the quantum features of the system, at least not directly. So what is important of these, these operators that we now have? Well, it's that they do not commute the X and the P. And so they are really, and this is why I, I talked really about, about optical phase space also. So here you see that this really behaves as a phase space in the sense um, that X and P do not commute and they satisfy the canonical anti, uh, the canonical commutation relation. So what this means is that they really behave as position and momentum operators. And you can actually think of this whole thing. Also, if you would kind of write down what the energy uh, of the electric field is, what you actually get is something that, that is just the equation of a harmonic oscillator. So these, these optical modes, you can think of them as, as, as quantum harmonic oscillators. And this is formalized here in these, uh, in these expressions. And of course, uh, as a consequence, we also have Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, which is exactly the reason uh, why, even if we turn off everything, we still have this, uh, this noise. So what this says is, so these are the, the standard deviations or the variances, if you like, of, um, of the noise in the real and imaginary part of the phase space. And so we can never get rid of this noise, which uh, we kind of represent in the following way. So here, usually what we now do is we represent the, the quantum state. So these are our operators. If you do quantum physics, you need to get expectation values of these operators by evaluating them in a, in a quantum state. And what we do is we represent our quantum states in a, in a, in a phase space as a, well, as a Wigner function, it turns out. And so these Wigner functions are for light, uh, like this, for example, this would really be a probability distribution on the phase space that basically tells us how the, what the statistics of this, of this noise is. Um, we can go to more exotic light, for example, there is a thing called squeezing. So here I completely turned off uh, basically the, the field. There is no, no average field. So there is no kind of oscillating behavior anymore. Um, but this isn't vacuum either. So the point is that here in this case, I'm actually going to significantly reduce the noise uh, at some points for some values of the phase or for some axis of the phase space. And as a price, I'm actually going to strongly enhance the noise in another uh, axis. So here, this is, if you look at the Wigner function representation of this, uh, of this light, you, you literally see this happening. You see that basically uh, you are going to reduce the noise here in this, uh, in this case it would be in the X direction. So this, this, uh, squeeze part of the Swigner function corresponds to this low noise. But then because we have to satisfy the uncertainty relation and we reduce the noise in X, the price you pay is that we have to extend the noise in P. And so this, uh, this exploit explosion of noise here is what you see here. So you, you compress the Wigner function in one direction and you have to stretch it in the other direction. So this is how you see that the uncertainty relation plays an important role here. And then finally, what we are very interested in our group is so-called non-Gaussian light. So here to kind of give you an idea that this really is what we do. This is uh, experimental data that we took a few years ago. Um, and so what you see here is basically uh, that this noise is no longer uh, going to be Gaussian. So on everything that I showed you on the previous slides, when you take out a little slice here, corresponding to a given phase or maybe a given small range, range of phases. If you look at what the statistics was on all the previous examples I gave you, you would always get the Gaussian. However, here in this case, you see that this distribution kind of, there, there are these openings appearing. At least statistically, there is more intensity here uh, than in the middle. And this is of course not Gaussian anymore. 
And it turns out to be something quite um, exotic because when we want to kind of represent the Wigner function that will give us this kind of noise in our, in our, uh, in our quantum light, we get something like this. And uh, what is important here is that this is no longer a probability distribution, but this actually has acquired some uh, small negative uh, region here. So this, this is what we call a quasi-probability distribution in the sense that um, if you basically integrate out one axis of phase space and you look at the other one, you really still get the right probability distribution of, of the measurements of this, this single observable, but because X and P do not commute, so the different axes of your phase space correspond to non-commuting observables, what this means is that you cannot jointly measure these observables. And so this, in turn, basically is telling you that you can have cases, quantum states, where you can just not describe what you see by just a joint probability distribution on, on this phase space. And so this is really a manifestation of this commutation relation that we see this negativity uh, popping up here. And this Wigner negativity, it might seem like an, an artifact, but actually it turns out that this is an extremely important feature because it is really at the heart of, of why certain um, quantum protocols, quantum information protocols are hard. We know that if we, if we do not have this negativity in a, in a quantum protocol, in a, let's say a quantum algorithm, that the quantum algorithm is ultimately easy to simulate on a normal computer. So this is an important feature. And so now I want to make the transition to multimode light. So everything I've shown you up to now, it's always one mode. So basically I just have one X and one P, which means that I'm looking at just one quantum harmonic oscillator. Now I want to make the transition to light, which is actually composed out of many quantum harmonic oscillators. So in our group, what we have, what we do is we have uh, pulse light. So this is kind of a train of little pulses of light arriving they are equally spaced. And if you send them through a prism and break them up in, uh, in frequencies, as, uh, as I showed you in this kind of, uh, in this little GIF, what you will actually see is that this train of, of pulses, so they are kind of very short in time, this translates to uh, what we call a frequency cone. So the idea is that you have many different frequencies contributing to this light but there is basically a discrete set of, uh, of frequencies. In reality, there are millions, so it's, it's, you don't really see that they are discrete when you, do, uh, when you resolve them. But in principle, uh, this, is, uh, this is the case. So of course, in this uh, specific example here, this would be the light that comes out of our laser. It's completely classical light. It's a very strong field. And so when you measure one of these uh, one of these teeth of the frequency comb, what will happen is that you will just see that it is describing basically one of the fields of a harmonic oscillator that I showed you on the previous slide. Now I really want to, to get quantum features in this thing. And so the way that we do this is uh, through, uh, through nonlinear optics. So what is going to happen is that we are going to inject this light into an optical cavity, basically a kind of box with two mirrors. Um, and in this cavity, in this box, we have a nonlinear crystal. And what this nonlinear crystal does is from time to time, it's going to take a blue photon of this light here. And it's going to break it up into two, um, into two red photons. And of course, uh, you are going to get correlations between these two red photons because you know that they are created at, at the same time. And you know that they are created and that they have, that they basically come from one photon, uh, one blue one, so they have to respect some energy conservation. So this translates to a sort of uh, quantum entanglement between these two photons. And what this cavity, this box is going to do, it's, it's, it's going to make sure that these photons, they keep on bouncing around for a while. And what 
happens then is that the light that ultimately gets coupled out of this cavity, because these mirrors are not uh, perfect, so every now and then some light is going out, um, that this is going to still conserve the properties of this uh, frequency cone. So if we would analyze it in this uh, frequency basis, we see that we still have many different teeth. So you can think of this as a whole bunch of uh, quantum harmonic oscillators in, that are independent. But because we have these correlations between these photons that are ultimately building up this whole, this whole light, so this is, it's not just a two photon state. So the fact that you have this bouncing around in this cavity means that sometimes you have no photons, sometimes you have two, sometimes there are four, sometimes, and so you get these even numbers of photons contributing to the state of light. So this becomes quite complicated. But what this turns out to be is uh, in the frequency basis, you get basically entanglement between all of these different uh, frequencies. So you can think of this as a bunch of quantum harmonic oscillators that are oscillating somehow in a, in a, in a correlated way, uh, in the sense that you have the global quantum state that describes it is going to be a correlated state. Of course, now, because we have uh, many, uh, many modes, the global light, which also is an, an observable now that describes this, uh, this system is going to, to contain like not just one, but many modes. So we have many of these uh, X and P operators coming into play now. And if you want to look at the, the quantum state that describes this, this particular light, um, that we create. Actually, I, I cannot even draw it because it's, uh, it's uh, going to be have a Wigner function, which is defined now on, on a multi-mode phase space. So we have a phase space for every mode. So we have to basically, the dimension of our phase space would be two times the number of teeth that we have here. And this is basically going to give us, uh, give us something uh, like a Wigner function that that is on this highly multidimensional phase space it's going to be a gaussian so what we do is we the process that we use is gaussian so we get this big gaussian but it will it will be really defined and stretch out over this full phase space we cannot describe it on on individual like as a product of individual uh, wigner functions for all these different teeth so then one Next thing that we can do, or that I want to emphasize, is that these, these modes, they are, they are in a way, they're a way of looking at the light. As I, as I showed you in this GIF, what, what you have on this side is this kind of big chunk of, of, of light. And then you can interrogate it in different ways. And so like when we put this prism, we break the light up in different frequencies. And so we get these different plane waves, but we can do other optical tricks to not get just plane waves, but get another mode basis. Um, and so this is what you, what you see uh, here. Actually, there is a, a, little, I'm, uh, a little J missing here because this would also have to be a mode basis. And so the idea is that, well, if we change the measurement setting, because these, the modes are what we are measuring ultimately. Um, we are going to change so the mode basis. And when we change the mode basis, we change the properties of the state. Why is this? Well, globally, we just have, we have our light and the global statistics of this light has to remain the same. So we have to, whatever mode basis we choose, it has to ultimately add up to the same multi-mode field. And what this means is that if we change the mode basis, so if we interrogate our, our light in a different way, um, then we have to basically have a different quantum state in this uh, specific case, in this specific mode basis, uh, to lead as a like globally to the same uh, global statistics that we get. Yet what we are looking at, what we measure ultimately in, in, a, in a setup is these individual modes. And so the idea is because changing the mode basis changes the properties locally of the state, what we want to do is actually we want to um, 
measure this, this state in an interesting uh, mode basis, in a mode basis where the quantum state of our system has interesting uh, properties. And so this is where I get to uh, engineering networks. Because there is a class of states that we are very interested in, which is called cluster states, and they are described by a network. So here, what you see uh, in this network is basically that every um, node represents an optical mode, which is prepared in one of these uh, squeeze states. And every uh, connection represents what we call a, a CZ gate. So it's basically an operation that creates entanglement. So what you see here, this representation, this is actually a recipe. What this tells you is you take this bunch of squeezed modes, of squeezed uh, states, basically, in, in different modes. And then you apply these particular entangling operations to them to get an entangled state. Now, uh, as you see here, these, uh, these squeeze states, they are, their Wigner functions are Gaussians. And uh, this operation here, and here you just have to believe me, this is an operation that actually conserves the Gaussian features of the state. So if I take two squeeze modes, let's say these two maybe, uh, and I apply this entangling operation to them, what comes out is, is again going to be, it's a multi-mode Gaussian function. And so what you have in principle is a recipe for a big entangled Gaussian state, where Gaussian now means that the global Wigner function is a Gaussian, which also translates to the fact that whichever mode or whichever mode basis you choose and whichever mode of this mode basis you measure, the measurement statistics, the noise will always behave in a Gaussian way. So how do we now? want to make these cluster states, or how do we do we make them? Well, I showed you this uh, before in our setup that basically this is the quantum light that we generate. And the idea now is then to go to a particular measurement basis, so to, to change this, uh, this part of, of the optics to something more, uh, more advanced. You, we use a thing called pulse shapers. Um, which will allow us to basically measure in a basis um, where, where the quantum state that describes this light now has exactly the right properties of such, a, of such a cluster state. So that the quantum state that we get in the end is exactly a state that can be obtained by applying such a, such a recipe. So to show you that we can do this, these are some uh, experimental data that were taken even before I, uh, I arrived uh, in the group. And so what this shows is that basically with these techniques, we can create a, a, a quite uh, reasonable range of small, relatively small graphs. So here we went in size up to, uh, up to 12 uh, nodes. But what I want to stress is that we basically can really control the shape of these, of these, uh, of these graphs. And so, just to tell you what is on the axis here, you can think of this as a, as a, a quality label for how good the, the graph is, is actually respecting the, the, the recipe. So in, it's experimental physics, things are never completely perfect, but the more negative th these values get, the better it is basically. And so what we want or what we need is that they are at least below this line, which is at zero. So everything is of a sufficiently good quality, let's say. And so again, we, we can basically make these, these networks in the shape that we want. And so this is why we call them imprinted networks. So we have our imprinted network is basically referring to the fact that we, we can create cluster state with, with the, the recipe graph that we want. And so, uh, so we can imprint this, uh, choose this, 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 this network to our liking. So the idea that we then have is to, to now build these networks. Uh, and this is more here, I'm more transitioning to, to theoretical things that we want to do. The idea that we have is to, to build these networks um, in a way uh, that they are complex. So 
the things that I'm going to discuss in this talk or in the remainder are going to be on the one hand, uh, Parabasi Albert networks of different parameters. So this is basically the tree. And here you add two connections when you grow your network in every step. Then we also have what Srogat's networks where I have different rewiring re coefficients or probabilities. Uh, and they are reasonably highly connected. So I start out from a, a regular graph, which has 10 nearest neighbors, so five on, on, on every side. Um, <clears throat> and so the question now is, well, we can create this as imprinted networks. We can build states that basically satisfy this, um, these recipes. Um, and so the question is, well, what are now well, what is what is what are the properties of these states? And so the problem that we are confronted with is if we take such uh, networks, because these are recipes saying you take different uncorrelated modes and you apply entangling operations to them according to the graph, you are tempted to say, well, this network also represents the correlations in your system. And this turns out to be false. And this is an important point because these correlations are important for many uh, quantum uh, information tasks. So the solution is to build new networks. So to study these systems and actually build a network that represents the correlations in the sense um, that we get kind of these, uh, these emergent features. In this. So we see that uh, there are many more correlations actually in the system between these modes than, uh, than, than you would think from the imprinted network. You see, I mean, this is especially here, in this, this Barabasi Albert case, you see this very well that like here, there is just one connection, but you see that there are, are like a vast number of correlations that are actually popping up. And so because these are really emergent features, they are not features that we build in uh, by design, this is a network that we choose, that we build, and then we have a new network that basically emerges on top uh, as a description of, of properties of this state. And so we're interested in the properties of these emergent networks. So we can see, for example, how uh, the adjacency matrix of this imprinted network, which is basically either one or zero, right? Either you apply the gate or you don't. Uh, and how they kind of what we want to understand first is how they this structure here influences the emergent uh, structure, the emergent correlations. So the emergent correlations are defined um, as the correlation between the number of photons. So these are a bunch of quantum harmonic oscillators where every oscillator can have basically a certain number of excitations, not specifically fixed. Um, and we can look at the, the correlations between the number of photons, or if you wish, the energies between different modes, nodes. Um, and, uh, and so this is basically the Pearson correlation coefficient that tells you, uh, it gives you a one when you have exactly the same number of photons in, in the two modes, uh, and it gives you a zero if they are completely uncorrelated. And if they're anti-correlated, we basically also just consider this to be the same as correlated. So it ends the, the absolute value. Um, and so, so yeah, so this is the number operator. So it's the operator that counts the number, like the statistics of how many photons we, we have. And because we have this kind of Gaussian noise, remember I told you this is a recipe for a Gaussian state, so whatever, basis we're going to look at for this light, uh, everything we have is always going to be, all the noise that we record is always going to be Gaussian. We can uh, use this feature to actually derive this adjacency matrix specifically for the Gaussian case and get the following expression. And here we see directly what the connection is between the adjacency matrix that we have for the imprinted graph and the adjacency matrix for the emergent graph. So don't, I don't really want you to focus too much on the, on the, the, the normalization factor. What I want to point out here is this factor that pops up. So this is a proportional, this is the square of, the, of the, the adjacency matrix of the imprinted network. 
And so what you can think of is this part here will, of course, tell you that if there is a connection in the imprinted network, you will have a correlation. But this part here tells you that if there is, uh, if you look at two points, and you can get from point I, I to point J with one intermediate step in the imprinted network, there will actually be a correlation. So there will be a direct connection in the emergent uh, weighted uh, correlation network. And these networks are actually very interesting for our real bread and butter of what we do in the group because we don't like Gaussian states actually. So the, the reason why continuous variable systems are very interesting is because we can get these gigantic entangled states, which, uh, so this is, is a lot of uh, activity that is going on, on on building these cluster states because they're very important for continuous variable quantum computing, but they're not enough on their own. What we need as a second ingredient is to have Wigner functions uh, that really have this kind of this negativity feature that, that, that I, I introduced before. And so in our group, our, one of our main activities is to try to, to reconcile these two, these two aspects and combine them. So how do we do this? Well, we, we, we take our Gaussian states and we do some fancy nonlinear optics to basically take out a photon. And so in, in this setup, what we do is we have this beam uh, that can be used to uh, control basically in which vertex, in which node, we want to take out specifically one photon. So we kind of have this detector. And when this detector clicks, we know that the photon is missing. And, and we basically, at this moment, know uh, that our state has changed because of this missing photon. And we see that there are going to be some non-Gaussian features that are going to appear. And even though here you don't see it locally in these individual uh, Wigner functions, on the global state, we hope to have this kind of Wigner negativity. And so what is interesting to, to note here is that even though we choose to kind of make this specific vertex non-Gaussian, so this one here, um, we see that actually these non-Gaussian effects they ripple out, so they, they are seen also in, in the other vertices. And uh, our question now is whether uh, we can also see this on the level of this emergent correlation network. So if we do this photon subtraction, um, can we actually see changes appearing in these emergent features? And so uh, what I'm doing here is actually I'm, I'm going to subtract 10 photons. And uh, what you see is, so this is a network that you have emerging uh, before photon subtraction. But if you then do the photon subtraction, so here in, in the, the red dot, right? The most correlated point or the most, like the hub of the system. Um, what you find is actually that after having subtracted photons, if then you, you reconstruct this uh, emergent network, it looks very differently. So first thing to note is that many of the existing correlations have changed. There are also many that have strengthened that have increased, but also a lot of new correlations have appeared. So there were, there were none before, there are some now after. Um, so how do we, do we understand this or how do we hope to understand these features? Well, First of all, um, we want to understand what the impact is of different network shapes uh, or that we imprint. And then we want to, to kind of try to resolve uh, local structures in these, uh, in these imprinted networks um, and to see what the influence of, uh, of basically of the photon subtraction is given different types of imprinted networks with local structures. So for the first part, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at what, how this effect changes when I change Barabasi, Albert, Watt-Strogatz networks. <clears throat> and in the second part, I'm really going to zoom in on the local features around the, ver the node where I'm subtracting the photon and see how they influence the effect uh, on, the, on the emergent network. 
So first things first, let's see what happens when we, when, we, when we do this. And so what I'm going to look at is now to get a kind of systematic idea, I'm going to look at the degree uh, distribution, the degree statistics. So basically in the emergent network, I'm going to look at the sum of all the weights connected to each vertex. And so this histogram represents a, a whole bunch of vertices. And here already what you see uh, is that uh, for these, uh, especially for the Barabasi Albert, uh, with, which is a tree, you basically get uh, still some kind of power law type behavior in this degree statistics. So this survives even in the emergent network. And what we see then is that when we subtract a photon in a hub, the weight of the tail is actually going to reduce. Whereas if we subtract a photon in a, in a random node, so typically one which is very weakly connected, we're actually going to increase the weight of the tail. So there is this very different behavior uh, appearing. And apart from that, like if we don't look at the tail, but at the bulk distribution, we don't see much. When we look at the, the higher degree uh, or the, let's say the more connected imprinted networks where we have two connections for every node that we add, um, we see that in these emergent networks, there are some bulk features appearing, but still the most important features, the most important effects are going to manifest in the tail. And this is contrasted quite, quite significantly by um, what we see in the what Srogat's networks, where we really see kind of a strong effect of photon subtraction in the bulk distribution. Of course, if we look at the, the emergent network of the, the Gaussian state, so before photon subtraction, this is going to have a statistics which is which is basically behaving quite a bit like a random, uh, like a random Erdos Renin network. So we see that there is not. There are no, in, in, in shape of the distribution, there are no gigantic changes, even though there is kind of a, a shift in, in where the distribution is situated. And so what we see here is that basically in all of these different examples, the, there is really kind of a, a drive towards higher uh, correlations, so to have higher weights in this emergent network after photon subtraction. Um, and so basically, uh, this like the, there is also a strong effect of the actual shape of, uh, of the graph, where actually we see the strongest effect in the most random uh, graph, basically. Um, and so just to tell you, these histograms are obtained for 100 node networks. Uh, and, and by basically combining data of 100 realizations of such 100 node networks. OK. so. Uh, then we want to kind of get a finer idea of what is happening. So I'm going to resolve now the structure more locally of what's happening in these networks. So this, for this imprinted network or this imprinted class of networks, the degree statistics is looking uh, like, like this in the emergent network. Um, and now what we are going to do is we are going to filter this histogram and pick out basically uh, like select on the distance from the point in which we subtract the photon. And so we look at these distances in terms of the, of the imprinted network. And so we see that the nearest neighbors in the imprinted network, um, that they actually have a very strong effect. The zero is a point where we subtract. So this is also very strongly shifted. Uh, and then we see, well, there is a, another effect for two. And then finally, if we are at like more than, than two steps away from the point where we subtract, there is almost no effect to be seen with respect to the Gaussian distribution that actually I should have maybe shown here, but it's, it's basically more or less the same distribution that you retrieve. So we can do this for all of these different, uh, these different what Srogatz networks, and we indeed see that like this fact that at distance three or more, uh, generally indeed we see we see no strong effect from the photon subtraction, uh, but then kind of the abundance of points at distance one and distance two is going to to really determine the shape of of the the final uh, 
distribution of degrees in the emergent network after photon subtraction. So to get a kind of more systematic idea, we can also do moment analysis. So we can analyze uh, the moments of this, uh, of this, this, uh, these distributions. So here I do show you in blue um, the Gaussian case and in red the case after photon subtraction. Um, and so this is for the means here on the, this axis, you see whether we are at which, whether we are in the point where the photon was subtracted at distance one, distance two, distance three or more. Uh, and then we can do the same thing for the Barabasi Albert networks. We can look at the shapes of these curves. And what the first thing that I noted when I looked at this was that, well, when you look at the mean and the variance, specifically for these what Strogatz networks, they all look the same. The, the, the details are different, like quantitatively, they behave differently, um, or there are some slight differences, but the general features are the same. Then you can look at the, the higher moments, and there you see that there is actually some, like they're much more wild. And so what we learn here is that, like the average features of the distribution seem to, to be more or less, to some extent, universal, like you always, have the same things like the same things happening regardless of the rewiring probability in these what Strogatz networks. But then the fine details of what the like finer shape of the distribution is going to be, this really depends on the on the, the, the parameters. Uh, and then there is a, another thing that I wanted to point out, which is that if you look at the points that are at distance two, at the mean and the variance. Then for all the networks, Barabasi, Albert, and Watsrogas, you always see that the photon subtraction increases the mean and increases the variance. So we have this kind of very systematic behavior for points at distance two, the points at distance zero, so the points where we subtract the photons, we have the same, the same thing happening. So there you also have the, basically that there is a, there is going to be a, like always is this increase in mean and variance. But when you then look at distance one, there is this one lonely uh, example that basically just seems to defy the rule. And this is uh, this case, the, the Barabasi Albert, at uh, which is like the tree network, where we see that basically all of a sudden photon subtraction reduces the mean and the variance at distance one. And so why is this? Well, it turns out that the answer to this question is, uh, is the same as the answer to the question, why do we have a distance one when we resolve these networks? Why do we have these little bumps appearing, which seems to, I mean, there seems to be a lot of structure at distance one that is not kind of systematically explained uh, just by resolving the distance. So why are there these bumps here? Well, the answer is hidden in the structure of the distance one subgraph. So here I kind of picked out the distance one uh, degree distribution. So just for all the, 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 the nodes that are neighbors in the imprinted network of the point where we subtract the photon. And when you look now at the subgraph, so you take this out of its parent graph or its parent network in the sub network, you see that it, there is a lot of structure. And what we did is basically, we grouped this, uh, we kind of again filtered this, this histogram uh, by looking at the different um, degrees of, this, uh, of these, these vertices or these nodes in the subnetwork. And so here, for example, this little uh, purple histogram here will correspond to vertices which are like this, which are nearest neighbors. They're not connected to any other nearest neighbors. And then we basically count here to how many other nearest neighbors they are connected. So here in this big uh, light uh, bluish chunk, we have vertices uh, like this one, which are highly connected uh, to other nearest neighbors. And this is something, of course, in these what Strogatz networks for low probabilities, we have a lot of this clustering, and so many of our nearest neighbors will be connected to other nearest neighbors. And so this is uh, something that we can look at now in a more 
systematic way. So we can do this filtering for our different families of what Strogatz networks. And we see that indeed this, this very accurately explains the different features that we see in this distance one histogram. And so for here we see that there are many more. Uh, so at the high rewiring, there are many more nearest neighbors that are not connected to any other nearest neighbors. Uh, and so we can kind of understand the global structure of this, uh, of this histogram now. And so in general, the more nearest neighbors that the nearest neighbor is connected to in the imprinted network, the stronger the effect of photon subtraction will be in these nearest neighbors um, in the emergent network. And so now I come back to this point, why does the Barabasi-Albert network defy this kind of general rule? Well, uh, when we look at, uh, at this, well, the graph that we have here, it's a tree. So none of the nearest neighbors is going to be connected to any other nearest neighbors. And so this means that actually, um, in this case, we will always be in this little bump that is, uh, that is at the side of the weak um, correlation. It turns out that actually, when you analyze these little bumps, uh, you, you see that actually there is systematically just for these uh, vertices specifically that have, uh, that have only one connect, like these nearest neighbors that are not connected to any other nearest neighbors, there you systematically see a reduction actually in the, in the degree, in the, the, the total weight uh, in the emergent network. And so we, we understand now this, this feature. So the conclusions and the take-home message. So my take-home message, I, I, I made it graphical. So um, you have this imprinted structure that we can build in the lab that we can control, say we want to create a quantum state, which is a graph state or a cluster state with this, with this graph. And this is something that we control. This is a network that we can build. And then we can look at emergent features. So how do correlations appear in this state? And how are these correlations changed when we subtract photons? Then we can look at this photon subtracted uh, networks. And we can look at in these emergent networks at how the degree distribution is going to, to behave. And we see this kind of manifestation here of, uh, of, of the photon subtraction. We see this, this shift to higher, uh, higher correlations, basically. And we can understand the structure of this histogram partly by resolving uh, the distances in the imprinted network from the point where we subtracted the photon. So basically, uh, at distances three or larger, not much is, is happening. Uh, and then we can look specifically to understand the structure of the nearest neighbor uh, subset of, of, of nodes. We can look at, uh, at, this, um, at this, this, this histogram again and resolve it depending on how many uh, nearest neighbors are connected to one another, basically. So looking at the connectivity of a nearest neighbor to other nearest neighbors. And this explains most of the features that we see. So I want to give you a quick outlook of what we want to do next. So uh, one thing, of course, is to look at, at uh, other properties of, of these emergent networks. So we want to, I think we want to really understand also what determines the structure of the next to nearest neighbor histogram. So we understand the nearest neighbor one, the next to nearest neighbor one is much more complicated. And so we don't really understand that yet. Um, we also want to, of course, check whether, um, whether there are maybe some other quantifiers. So we looked at the correlate, uh, at clustering coefficients as well in our paper. Uh, and there are many other quantifiers of, of the networks that could give us more information and teach us more about the features of these uh, emergent correlation networks. Then, of course, there is also the fact that we are not fo forced to look at correlations of numbers of photons. So we could look at other correlation uh, or other emergent networks. So one thing that comes to mind is uh, mutual information. So this is... Uh, 
very hard to calculate for our setups, but still we hope that we can maybe find ways to, to do this. Um, and so then uh, finally, what, what for me at least is one of the, the more uh, important long-term questions is uh, all that we have looked at here in these emergent features is emergent um, correlations. And what I'm really interested in is understanding at what of what we see is actually a signature of things like quantum entanglement, quantum steering, so quantum correlations really rather than just uh, than just classical statistical correlations. And so the question is whether there is some signatures of, of quantum correlations hidden here in these, these networks. And so uh, with this, I want to conclude. So I, I, I guess uh, let me thank, first of all, the whole group. Uh, so here you see uh, most of the people are experimentalists, so they still go to the lab uh, to, to do uh, experiments. So I want to introduce you, first of all, to Valentina Parigi, who is uh, sitting here, who is basically uh, in charge of, uh, of most of the network activities in our, in our group. Uh, so she has an ERC project to, to build uh, these kind of complex networks in our quantum experiments. So we have two uh, PhD students working on this, which are Francesca and, uh, and David. Are sitting here so both of them are, are experimentalists francesca is kind of a theoretician as well so uh, uh, but they were not involved in in, in this uh, work uh, in, in particular and with this i guess i want to to end uh, my talk and i also want to so thank you for your uh, attention and given that i will probably upload this uh, to youtube i will also say that to the people who watch this all the way to the end. Thank you for being very brave. And if you have any questions or something or comments, uh, please feel free to put them in the comment section or otherwise kind of drop me a, an email or, or something like that. And uh, then all what remains is to, for me to stop recording and uh, say, well, see you uh, next time. Bye.